I'm not much of a gardener. I don't really enjoy the planting and maintaining of plants, and I definitely strongly dislike weeding, but I enjoy looking at the flowers and plants and admiring their beauty once they are planted, so it's mostly worth the effort. However, as much as I do not know about gardening, I do know that there are certain things that every plant needs. It needs water, it needs light, and it needs a connection to sustenance. A plant that gets ripped out of the ground, as mine do regularly when my resident squirrel comes digging in my flower pots, does not survive. In our text this week, we have another I am story from Jesus. Last week, we had Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. And today he says, I am the true vine. And this seems a timely scripture. It's the time of year when we're out in our yards, tending and trimming and tweaking our gardens. I need to learn how to prune unruly plants. And there's lots of different advice about pruning, but this much is understood. Any branch of a plant that does not bear fruit draws nourishment away from those that do. If they are permitted to remain on the plant, the crop will be smaller and of less quality. So a good gardener will remove the non-bearing branches. It's on the new growth that fruit develops. So this text really comes alive to me and spend some time outside observing nature and you can't help but relate to it as well. It's a text clearly describing how we as Christ's disciples need to be firmly rooted into the one source of life, Jesus Christ. And the image used is that of a, a vine and its branches. Jesus, as always, uses an example that his followers can understand. Those agrarian people, they live in a culture that is familiar with vines. They understand the work that goes into getting the maximum output of fruit per vine. In this text, you and I are the branches, and we cannot bloom to our fullest God-desired potential unless we are abiding in or rooted in the vine, which is Jesus. And the reason we abide in the vine is that so we will be able to bear fruit. And what is bearing fruit? It's using the gifts and graces that God has given to each and every one of us to reflect the light and love of God in all that we say and all that we do. And the master gardener is God tending to the branches that's us, through the vine, Jesus. And through this sometimes uncomfortable, seemingly backstepping pruning process, we will continue to bear fruit. Fruitfulness is the overwhelming desire of this passage. The words bear fruit in some form appear six times alone in these eight verses. Fruit bearing is something that can only happen if the branches abide in or make their home in, stay connected to the vine. And the verb abide also appears over and over in this passage eight times in just four of the eight verses. So abiding in God is clearly important to the writer of the Gospel of John. The branches have to abide because without the vine, they can do nothing. Reverend Suzanne Guthrie writes, when I was about 11 years old, I developed a passion for the work of Luther Burbank after I'd read about his gardens in my mother's old book of knowledge. Now, if you're like me and you don't know who Luther Burbank is, he was an American botanist, horticulturist, and pioneer in agricultural science. He developed over 800 strains and varieties of plants over his career including fruits, flowers, grains, grasses, and vegetables. She continues, I learned that you can graft a desirable, of a desirable trait from the branch of a particular fruit or flower onto another plant with stronger roots and stalk. You can grow a tree with many different kinds of blossoms or fruits on it. 
I came to love gardens, and for most of my life, I've been a flower gardener. You have to be ruthless to garden successfully. Out go the weaker plants and weeds, dividing the thriving ones before they crowd everything else out, deadhead them daily, hunt for and destroy slugs in the buggy evening and again early morning, and prune, prune, prune. For me, working in the garden and Jesus' teaching of the vine helps me not to panic, but to live into the perspective of our connectedness to one another and to the Holy One. The reading of the vine and branches reminds me I am not only in community with other people, and that I am also inseparably grafted to the vine, the source of my deep and enduring happiness and love. Life is grounded in community. We are planted with neighbors, our vines and our roots systems in mesh. We drink the same water and breathe the same air. Jesus taught that you can't love God and not strive to love others. Now, two times in this text, Jesus promises, I am the vine. It's a promise that we are not alone, or we don't have to be if we make the choice to abide in God. We are not left to fend for ourselves without aid or guidance or nurturing. We, if we choose, can be firmly rooted to the source of all of our joy and hope and strength, Jesus. If we choose, we can, each and every one of us, be transformed by a new reality in which we are empowered and equipped and called to be Jesus' disciples and to bear fruit. But it's something we have to choose because God never forces God's love on us. But just as Jesus is intimately connected to the Father, we branches can do nothing unless we abide in relationship with our resurrected Christ. As I mentioned earlier, abide with me can also be translated as make your home with me or stick with me. And the words stating that we cannot bear fruit apart from God, they're not meant to be a threat. There's a lot about this passage that's scary and intimidating. The words are not meant to inflict fear or judgment, Rather, these words are an invitation to new life and a promise by God to be with us always. Abiding in Jesus means that we cannot go it alone in our spiritual lives because Jesus said the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. And we talk about that a lot, don't we? We can't do this alone. We need each other. That's why we come. Is relying on the vine easy? No way. It can be scary. Is relying on the master gardener easy? Not even. Because when we are pruned, it will at times alter our very being and form. Because every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more. And so abiding in Christ means also allowing ourselves to be changed allowing ourselves to be molded, formed, trusting that our Creator God who made us and who redeems us and who loves us knows exactly the best way to prune each one of us so that we might bloom. Sadly, because I love putting flowers in my house, cut flowers or other plants don't last long apart from the larger tree or vine or plant to which they were attached. They might be able to, with the help of water and plant food and a refrigerated cooler, hold their bloom for a time, but quit, pretty quickly they will wither and die. And it's the same with you and me. When I'm not connected to God, I wither, I struggle, I don't thrive. I might seem to flourish for a time, a short time, on the outside because I can put on a good show just like you can. I can dress myself up or put on some lipstick or put on a smile. But on the inside where things are really important, if I'm not connected to God, I'm slowly dying. And eventually the truth cannot be hidden any longer. And like it or not, the same is true for you as well. 
So ask yourself this, do I feel connected to God? How about this one? Do I feel connected to my family or my congregation or for that matter, anyone? Do I feel connected? We cannot feel connected with someone unless we make them a priority, invest our time and effort in knowing them and in sharing our vulnerabilities. And this includes God. But I see people having an increasingly difficult time maintaining meaningful relationships. And again, this includes our relationship with God. We live in an age of increasing 24-hour connectedness through technology. We are one second away from sending and receiving messages and pictures, sharing news with our friends and families, all with the push of a button and without meaningful one-on-one -on -one interaction. I remember when I was about 19 or 20, I was home on summer break from college and I was working in the fields and I started using mom and dad's car once in a while to go out with friends. And they'd gotten this new fancy invention called a car phone. It came in a little suitcase, although by today's standards, it was huge. It was inconvenient and bulky. It had a little zipper. It had the cord that attached it to the, uh, the cigarette lighter. But dad insisted I take it with me in case I needed help. It seemed a little over the top to me because if I needed help, I'd just walk to the nearest store or home or someone would stop and help me. But I took it with me just to humor him. Fast forward six or seven years later and my dad's had a series of heart attacks in another state and suddenly it's imperative to me that I never be out of touch with my family. And so I get my first cell phone. It was significantly smaller, by the way. I needed to have the reassurance that my family could call me at any time, no matter where I was. Fast forward again, 24 more years, and today I feel naked without my phone. I have it up here with me in case one of you get hurt or sick and we need assistance, even though I know you all have phones as well. I keep it up here in case my family has an emergency and needs to reach out to me. Sometimes I have it on me because I'm on call for my work. I use it to do just about everything. I look at news, I check the weather, I connect with family and friends, I look up information, I buy things. And that in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing because it's okay for things to be easily accessible but we also have to make sure we're connecting in a meaningful way to other humans. And research is beginning to reveal an unexpected downside to all of this accessibility. We might be so in touch and linked in with more people than ever via technology, but we as a society are also feeling increasingly isolated, lonely, and depressed. We have the world at our fingertips, and yet we are, some of us, particularly the younger generations, starved for actual experience, particularly the experience of being in real relationships. And I define real relationships as being two or more people interacting in real time, face to face, with all vowels intact. I'm convinced with all the texting that takes place where people randomly remove the vowels out of words, we're creating entire generations of people who will grow up unable to spell correctly and who won't know what vowels are. That's my prediction. And maybe that's where we need to start with recognizing the difference between mere connection, which we can have over technology, and actual relationship. I think that's what Jesus is offering us here real relationship, community, the messiness of being vulnerable with one another. Psychiatrist Cheryl Turkle gave a TED Talk. Maybe some of you watched some of those TED Talks out there. Hers was entitled Connected But Alone. And I was riveted to my computer screen. That's ironic, actually. She's an appropriate person to address these concerns about disconnectedness and relationships as a result of connectedness with technology 
because she was one of the early advocates of the internet and its ability to help us connect with each other. But years later, she is not seeing what she had anticipated and she's concerned. She writes, or she said, an 18 year old who communicates primarily through texting said to me, someday I would like to learn how to have a conversation. When I ask people what's wrong with having a conversation, people say, I'll tell you what's wrong with having a conversation. It takes place in real time and you can't control what you're going to say. So that's the bottom line. Texting, email, posting, all of these things let us present the self as we want to be. We get to edit, we get to delete, and that means we get to retouch ourselves. Human relationships are rich and they're messy and they're demanding and we clean them up with technology. And when we do, one of the things that can happen is that we sacrifice conversation for mere connection. We shortchange ourselves. And over time, we seem to forget this. Communicating via texts about concrete issues works. Examples, what time are you gonna be home? What time is dinner? Can you pick up a gallon of milk on your way home? But it doesn't work for learning about each other intimately, for really coming to understand and know one another. It can't replace face-to-face -face time. Have we lost confidence that we will be there for each other? that we expect more from technology and less from each other. We're vulnerable, but we're afraid of our vulnerability. That's Sherry Turkle. I can't speak for you, but a lot of this really hits home with me as not only the mother of a 19-year-old who is always on his phone, but also because of my own use of it as well. So vines are amazing plants. They are survivors. They are overachievers. But left unchecked, vines can be pests. They can take over. Vines unpruned, branches untrimmed can get into this jumbled mess. I have some in my yard where you can't tell the vine from the branches. While Jesus lifts up the importance of the vine's connectiveness, just as important is the vine's fruitfulness. And fruitfulness requires training and pruning and directing of the branches. If we are allowed to grow wild, we'll grow ever which way, and we'll be unlikely to put much of our energy into producing the fruits of God's kingdom. But following Jesus means being led to grow in the direction of righteousness. And this is a challenge because it makes us feel vulnerable. There's that word again. And it causes us to engage in the messiness and unpredictability of life. We have to choose to allow ourselves to be connected in meaningful relationships with one another for better and for worse in our messiness and our real time imperfections. And we have to choose to allow ourselves to be pruned and directed by God in such a way that we might bear fruit as a witness to others of the love of God in Christ. We do not get to be the vine we do not get to be the vine grower. We are branches to whom God has given a choice. We can choose to make our home in Christ, or we can choose not to make our home in Christ. And Jesus tells us what is at stake in making this choice. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, neither can we unless we abide in God. And so this week, I want all of us to sit and think honestly about this. In whom or what are we abiding? Because we're making our home in something. We're connecting with something. Is it something that will allow us to bear fruit for God's kingdom? In whom or what are we investing our time, our attention, our resources, our energy? Because that's the greatest indicator of what really matters to us. And we all have things that we need to prune out of our lives in order to be more firmly connected with God. What do you need to cut out of your life that is preventing you from living according to the vision of your creating, pruning God? Because God has a vision for us. God has a, a beautiful desire for us to not just survive, 
but to thrive and to blossom. Make your home in God, that wherever you go, you will be sheltered because you abide with God. Live at home in God as God lives at home in you. Invest your time and energy in God and in real fruitful relationships. Don't allow the dead branches in our lives deplete our joy and hope because God wants so much more for you and for me. And thanks be to God that God does want more for you and for me. Amen.